energy. Thanks. I don't think it's working, is it? Hello. Thanks so much for the warm introduction. Uh, if you were here last year, I think you may have seen the workshop that was about traffic gossip saying where we demonstrated fusing to the browser. What I would like to do this time around is I would like to talk about the technical details of how rapid gossip is works because I think it's actually really fun critical to really do a deep dive on. And uh, well, as you know, rapid gossiping is supposed to be an alternative to the regular peer-to-peer -peer gossip that we are familiar with today. And peer-to-peer uh, -peer gossip, the way it works is uh, you have a lightning node, you connect to a peer, and then you ask for a bunch of gossip-related messages from a certain block range, and uh, then you get those messages one by one. You get the channel announcement, you get for each channel a bunch of channel updates in each direction, and uh, because you don't come back. Sorry, guy. Because each message is completely separate, there is some amount of data duplication going on. Come on. Sorry. I swear it will. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Yeah. So there is some data duplication across the messages, which I will touch on shortly. Now, as, um, as of last week, which is when I was building these slides, there were about uh, 16,500 nodes and maybe 73,000 channels. And uh, if you think about the way that peer-to-peer uh, -peer gossip works, because a channel has one announcement for, for symmetrical data and uh, an update in each direction for asymmetrical data, that means that we are talking about at least 73,000 channel announcement messages and about 140, 146,000 channel update messages every single time you're trying to connect and get the entirety of the ground. So, if you're trying to do that on a mobile device, it can be a little slower and it can take a lot of time. So that is why we decided to build Rapid Gossip Sync. What Rapid Gossip Sync is, is um, it's a semi-trusted alternative to right there here to your gossip sync. Why is it semi-trusted? Well, you can run your own rapid gossip sync server if you so chose. And because you can do that, we decided to make some trade-offs such as getting rid of the signatures. Because um, you don't really need to verify them. If you don't verify the signatures, what you're exposing yourself to in terms of gossip is, uh, is DOS attack vectors, but you're not really exposing yourself to a uh, loss of funds. There, there are some edge cases that I can touch on later on, but uh, the risk is primarily DOS. And because we're able to do some nifty optimizations, we were able to get a 90% reduction in the amount of uh, data that is sent over the wire, as well as a 95% reduction in sync time. Uh, the, the sync time, by the way, if you're trying to start up a lightning app, a lightning node on mobile, you just connect to, to a separate lightning node and wait for your, your gossip sync to connect. It, it might take up to a couple minutes. So let's see what exactly it is that we are trying to do in order to eliminate all of this, uh, all of this overhead. How, how can we accelerate that? And to figure that out, I think let's first start by talking about what exactly the status quo looks like of your, your gossip sync. As I was uh, alluding to before, we have symmetrical data and we have asymmetrical data. Because we have things in a channel such as, you know, just which nodes does a channel connect. And there is nothing that is specific to the direction in which, uh, there is nothing directional about this sort of data. That is what's being transmitted in the channel announcement. But we also have directional details such as fees. A node that is processing inbound uh, HDLCs may be charging a different fee than the other counterparty that is charging for HDLCs in the opposite direction. So, considering that we have these sort of distinctions, let's, uh, let's actually delve deeper still and look into the anatomy of both the channel announcement message, which is a symmetrical one, and the channel update message, which is asymmetrical, where we have to have at least one in each direction. You can see from the very beginning, and this is, by the way, where I think I'll try to use the laser pointer. 
Is this the button? Yeah, it is. So we have we have a bunch of data that is being duplicated all over the place. For example, the chain hash, right? So that is 32 bytes that are being sent in every single message that never change. Once we start up our lightning node, we're never going to try to stick something from testnet or reg test or or got from the light point, right? So why why don't we just get rid of that? The other thing is we already said earlier that uh, because it's something trust that we are running, we can run our own server instance if we so chose. We might as well get rid of the signatures, right? The signatures are a lot of data. So in the announcement, we have four times 64 bytes because we have signatures for the on-chain data as well as signatures that prove the node ownership. So let's get rid of those, and let's also get rid of the signature that is in the channel update. We are immediately saving 288 bytes from the chain hash in the channel announcement and 96 bytes in the update so far. So we already have quite a significant reduction. The thing is, you will notice though, is a channel announcement says that a lightning channel is between two lightning nodes. And it identifies those nodes by specifying their top keys. But it also identifies the corresponding on-chain top keys to prove that, yes, you are actually able to produce a signature for those on-chain funds. You have the money available. You're not just uh, trying to, to advertise money that you don't have. And because we are getting rid of, getting rid of the signatures, so we can't really verify it anyway, we may as well get rid of the on-chain top keys and just leave the top keys identifying the nodes that the channel connects. So here, we just get rid of two top keys, which also saves us time. The other thing is that a channel update, unlike a channel announcement, contains the timestamp of when it was broadcast. However, there's usually a lot of variability, especially if you only care about the latest information. So instead of having a different timestamp for each individual channel update, we might as well only send one and get rid of uh, the per, per message timestamp altogether. So now, you see, we have reduced the amount of data that we're sending quite a bit, but that's still not quite everything that we can do. So first of all, let's, let's get rid of all of those lines with the stuff that we have removed, because I think the tables may look a little bit too crowded. So this is a slightly more compact representation. And some of the optimizations that we can do, I think I want to address separately, because some apply to the channel announcement other supply to the channel update. So with the channel announcement, if we look at it, we have the SCAD, we have two pub keys, we have the channel features, which uh, you know can be variable length, which uh, we're just not going to count for the time being. And we're working with 74 bytes right now. However, what happens if you have a really well-connected node and you're getting all of that node's channels? Well then, this particular node's public key is going to keep showing up in every single channel announcement that you see that is connected to it. So is there a way that we could maybe optimize that out? And as it happens, there is. We can, in, instead of sending the entire public key or both public keys in each channel announcement message, what we can do is we can create a lookup table. We can create an array of all the public keys that are going to be included in our gossip data. And then, instead of sending the puppies, we simply send an index. The index can be a big size, as uh, you know the data structure from the Lightning Protocol. And that way, we reduce it from 33 bytes per key to up to 9 bytes in the worst case scenario. Let's, um, that is unfortunately the only optimization that we're able to find that only applies to the channel announcements, but they are already pretty small after removing all of the signatures and half the top keys. So I think the big thing to address next is the, the channel update. The channel update really is the cornerstone of communicating information about a channel in Lightning. This is where all of the nitty gritty details are contained. This is where you have the expiry delta, the minimum MSAT, the maximum MSAT, the uh, 
base fee, the proportional fee, all of that fun stuff. And, uh, you know, even though it's only 35 bytes, if you have, if you're working with uh, 73,000 channels and therefore at least 146,000 channel update messages, it builds up quite a bit. So, something we can do is, uh, let's, let, let's first of all analyze the fact that uh, channel flags are currently one byte of which we are only using two bits. We're using the zero bit to indicate the direction to which this particular update applies. And we're using the first bit to indicate whether or not the channel is supposed to be enabled or disabled. Because nodes have the option of temporarily or permanently disabling a channel in a particular direction. Like if they say they don't want to they don't want to route, they, they want to opt out. We have another six bits that are remaining completely unused. So one could wonder, is there anything productive that we could do with them? And the answer obviously is yes. The thing is, because you're running your own rapid gossip sync server, or you know, even Matt Corral is running a rapid gossip sync server that most people are using this um, well, nowadays, because you're fetching your data from this server and you're telling the, the server, the timestamp at which you have last fetched information, the server knows what updates you have seen before and which ones you haven't. So if you have seen an update before and now the only change that has happened to a particular channel is maybe the base fee has been reduced a little bit or the HDLC minimum MSATs have been increased, you only really care about those particular changes. You don't need to have the entirety of the remainder of the update being communi communicated to you, right? So what if we were able to distinguish between sending a full channel update and only sending an incremental channel update where we specify which particular properties have been mutated? And what's really, what worked out really great is the fact that we have five properties here, right? Like CLPB expiry, HDLC min, HDLC max, fee base, fee proportional. We have five properties that are really the ones that we care about. And we also have now five remaining unused bits. So what if we simply match those bits to the properties that we have, and then if a particular bit is set, we send the new value for this particular field, and if it isn't, we just don't. That way, if we have an incremental channel update, we only need to send the fields that have been changed, and the rest we can completely omit. However, this is a nice optimization if somebody has seen a channel before, but what if you're doing a full sync? What if it is your first sync, and all of the updates are full? None of them are incremental. Is there anything we can do there too? Well, as it turns out, there is. Because, you know, for, for better or worse, there are some default values that nodes end up using. Values that comprise maybe 8% of uh, all of the values that are being sent for any particular field. Like, say, most everybody maybe uses a, a proportional fee of, uh, I don't know, say, say 3%, right? I'm making up these numbers, by the way. But uh, that's beside the point. If we have predominant values, what we could do is, why don't we compile them in the beginning, and we send one set where we say, hey, this is the default for the CLP expiry, this is the default for HDLC minimum, this is the default for HDLC maximum, and then, for full updates, we only set those bits corresponding to those fields if in this particular update for this particular channel, we have a value that is deviant from the default that is the predominant value. That way, if we have values that are being shared across 8% of all updates, we don't need to send anything for those messages because we just say, hey, this is the default. We don't need to send any of those additional bits. That way, we are also able to save a lot of space. 
And this is probably the greatest optimization that we can have. So the thing is though, the defaults, they also, well, the defaults, they be defaults. However, between each step up, sorry. That's all right. You're back. The, the thing is, when we when we send the data to the client, when the rapid gossiping server compiles what I want to call a snapshot, it might be that between different snapshots, even though various implementations may have defaults, maybe more updates have been sent by uh, an implementation that has uh, other def defaults than a different implementation. So in between snapshots, we might have different values that occur the most frequently. So one minor optimization that we have on the server is that we actually check which value is the one that occurs most frequently, and that is the one that we then set as the default that we sent in the beginning of the snapshot, which... Uh, hey, I'm sorry, can you unplug and re... Okay, never mind. You're good. Yeah, so I was just saying that we calculate the default value based on this particular value's incidence frequency. Uh, further, if we send an incremental update, but all five values have changed, it doesn't really matter whether it's incremental or full. We might as well just send it as a full update and incorporate the, those values in the calculation when we figure out which one, which value is the default that occurs the most frequently. But one thing that is particularly fun that I have not touched upon yet is um, if we look at the anatomy of these things, well, let's, let's go back to a slide where we have both. Both announcements and updates have SCID values, which are eight bytes. And those SCIDs are kind of random, and uh, well, they depend on the block height in which something has been, in, in, in which uh, a channel has been opened. And if they're unordered, then we always have to have, we always have to send the full eight bytes, the, the, the full eight bytes. And so we we're wondering, is there any way we might be able to perhaps optimize it somehow? And as it turns out, there is. Because if we simply sort all the channel announcements and all the channel update, updates by the SCID, then we can send the first SCID as the full eight bytes, but then we can only send the incremental updates as a big size, which can, can be up to nine bytes, but usually it's gonna be significantly smaller, like maybe one or three bytes. And if we do that, we are also once again able to squeeze out a bunch of compression out of, uh, out of this protocol. So that is the other thing that we do. We sort the SCADs, and instead of sending the full SCAD, we just send SCAD. SCAD deltas. And what does that yield us? Well, if we wanted to send a full snapshot where we are trying to send the entirety of the graph, and uh, you had to have all of those 70 plus thousand channels and their corresponding updates, we we're able to squeeze it to just 4.1 megabytes. And if you compress it with GZIP, it's actually just 1.8 megabytes. That is for a full update. If you have a client that has last requested a sync yesterday and now wants to see what data has changed since then, for just a one-day interval, it's like 400 kilobytes uncompressed. For a seven-day interval, it's 840 kilobytes uncompressed. Those are values that I have been seeing like over the last week or two. This, this reduction is incredible. And what's best is that on a mobile device, in the most adverse of scenarios, where it takes a lot of time for you to be able to, you know, like you, you, you maybe have a really long round trip to, uh, say, US East from, from Japan or from Europe or from where have you, and uh, you have to download a full snapshot because it's your first time syncing, and then you have to process it, and you have to parse it, you have to build the graph on your mobile client. Well, all in all, in the worst case scenario, on a comparatively slow phone, it'll take up to eight seconds. So if you're trying to have a Venmo or hash up like experience where you're starting an app and 
you are trying to do peer-to-peer -peer gossip thing, where it takes a couple minutes for you to be able to just draw a payment. Well, with this, this problem is eliminated. And uh, Matt Farrell will always tell you that eight seconds is still really long and really painful. And uh, I mean, he's not wrong. However, you can kind of mask it with some pretty innovations or <laughs> some annoying, you know, please we'll press this button to uh, allow push notifications, to allow us to track you, and all the other dark patterns that mobile apps like to do these days. But you can mask it. And once you've done it, at the end of the day, eight seconds later, you're able to draw the payment. I'm, I'm, I'm aware. So, the other thing is though, if you want to run your own rapid gossiping server and you don't want to, you don't want to trust Matt Morales, even though really you should, I mean, he's a good guy. <laughs> the code is open source. And so, uh, feel free to just check it out. There is a GitHub link which uh, I foolishly did not include here. Uh, one thing I want to touch on is that uh, the snapshots unfortunately have to be discrete. We cannot calculate them on the fly. But uh, feel free to, to try it out, feel free to run it. It's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, we, we hope that this helps and we hope that uh, this maybe also inspires you to build, build projects that uh, are also really efficient and optimized.